And if we look at the Jewish left, it wasn't just a labor movement. It was poetry. It was theater. It was music. It was schools. Um, just like, you know, this pantheon of just absolutely stunning movement. I'm Ellen Belshaw. And I'm Ezel Carter. And you're listening to Recollections. We are coming to you from the stacks of the Jewish Public Library Archives and Special Collections. Thank you so much for joining us. May 2024 marks the 110th birthday of the Jewish Public Library. We are celebrating with the launch of this new podcast in which we reflect on JPL and Montreal's rich leftist history. In this series, you will be treated to a sampling of Jewish leftist history interviews with scholars, activists, teachers, and fellow archivists. A gathering of recollections regarding our collections. Welcome to Recollections. Okay. All right. Ellen, let's do it. Let's, let's talk about well. it. Yeah. Why this podcast? Why this topic? Why now? The easiest first answer is the 110th anniversary of the library. Of course. Right? Yeah. So we've been looking back on our history, the history of the library, and uh, finding a lot of leftist threads that we didn't necessarily know were there. I mean, we've only been at the JPL for two years, so we're very new to this topic. It's true. And I have only been in Montreal for four years, right? So yeah. I'm even newer I guess. I've got almost a decade on you, but that's I'm still learning many things every day. <laughs> <laughs> I think for me, uh, it's about understanding how much I have benefited from the work of the left. Totally. Right? And yeah. even the left, right, is a contentious phrase. Oh, yeah. We're going to get into that. Oh, in yeah, we are. Yeah, most definitely. I mean, there's no way not to. <laughs> oh, yeah. The labor organizing is a very strong part of this history. Yeah, and as a woman, I cannot possibly ignore the fact that so much of the rights that I have right now are due to the people that came before me. Um, I think for me, and, and maybe for you, I had no idea how much of that was tied into Jewish immigration. I had a little bit of an idea, but working here has definitely opened my eyes to how integral Jewish history is to Montreal history, for sure. So, yeah, I think that that's... A good answer for all of that. I think as far as why a podcast, why a project taking this form. So Ellen and I are not subject matter experts. We do consider ourselves a little bit of history buffs, but um, we are coming out of a space that is a communal endeavor, started that way, continues to be that. So we had a lot of people willing to help um, who had this as their lived experience. Or as their whole professional career. We have a, a bit of a range of people that we've spoken to on this who um, come from this academically, uh, from their own history. So there's uh, a mix of voices you'll hear. Yeah, I, yeah, absolutely. We wanted to get a diverse mix of voices. I mean, because especially too, as you'll hear again in a future episode, the left was a diverse mix of voices there was no one right answer no pun intended <laughs> um and so i think that we were really fortunate that when we started you know the whispers started going around about the project people wanted to help um and also we live in this age now where uh we can rely on technology to craft a new form of storytelling um, and that's kind of what we're trying to do here. So it's a really broad topic. We can only really scratch the surface. On that note, are you ready to get started, Ezel? I absolutely am, yes. Okay. Uh, we start this episode along the main in the early 20th century with Pierre Antille, author and educator focused on the history of immigration in Quebec and in Canada and of Jewish culture in Montreal. Well, the main, Boulevard Saint-Laurent, it was first La Rue Saint-Laurent in up to 1905, um, was the main thoroughfare in Montreal from the river all the way up to Laval. So everyone, anyone moving 
around in Montreal had to go and be on that artery. And the Jewish community arrived either by rail or by boat in the port and moved up into Montreal along the Saint Laurent axis, I mean. Um, so for, uh, I'd say a period of just before World War I to until just after World War II, this is where, for 30 years or something, this is where most of the Jewish institutions of Montreal were. Around Parc Jean Mans also, just next, which is Fletcher's Field in Mordecai Richler's novels. And um, there was a dense city. There was uh, people live right next to the garment factories where they worked. They could go to a synagogue on foot. They could get all they needed in the immediate surrounding environment. And so it was a, it was a place, it's a place where the Jewish community formed and thrived for at least 30 years. The main was not only Jews, but almost every form and shape or type of immigrant that was coming into Montreal at the time. The Italians established themselves just north of the Jewish community. Uh, the Ukrainians and the Slavs and others. So it was not just a Jewish enclave, but it was an immigrant enclave where, where Yiddish and the Jewish culture was dominant. For French Canadians, it was something else because French Canadians were not immigrants. Or if they were immigrants, they were immigrants from the outlying areas. They came from farms, but, but it's still the same country. They spoke the same language. It was used by French Canadians as a place of trade. They could obtain merchandise, often from Jewish stores, or as a place of entertainment because of the clubs, the striptease places. You could also uh, do uh, illegal betting. I mean, it was a place where French Canadians congregated for other reasons, but it was also very central to French Canada. Prostitution as well, um, all kinds of cinemas, theaters, including Yiddish theaters, to which I suppose French Canadians would not go so often. And uh, as a teeming place, it's a place full of energy on, on about five streets on each side of Boulevard Saint Laurent. So it was, it was the place where immigration arrived and where immigrants Canadianized. In all of Canadian history, it's a central place. For French Canadians, it's a place where you went to, to reach to the outside world, in other words. The two ideas that I think are helpful are the dissolution of um, Poland and Lithuania in the late 1700s and the Pale of Settlement. Sam Bick is a PhD student in York University's History Department and the former host of Montreal-based anarchist Jewish podcast, Trafe. And both of those, I think, are helpful geographic historical events that can help understand how we get left Jews in Montreal in the early 1900s. In the late 1700s, there are several empires in that part of the world, Prussia, Austro-Hungary, uh, Lithuania and Poland, or Poland and Lithuania, and the Russian Empire. And there's a bunch of conflicts in the late 1700s, and the area that had what, the most amount of Eastern European Jews that we understand today, it, a lot of which was in Congress Poland, uh, Belarus, Lithuania, Latvia, parts of Poland, as I mentioned, Ukraine, they all fall under the, the Russian Empire. Jewish incorporation into the Russian Empire is happening at a time when the Russian Empire is changing tremendously capitalism, what people call modernity, imperialism, ideas of liberalism are spanning the globe. There's a lot of change happening in Russia. Jews who were previously under a different relationship, many of whom relationships, for example, with the Polish kingdom, uh, are now facing kind of a new series of dynamics. And Russia's initial response to this is to kind of outline a section in the West where most of the Jews were already living called the Pale of Settlement, uh, 
and that is kind of the geographic area that Jews more or less have to stay in. By the 1860s, 1870s, 1880s, Russia is undergoing a change from a, a, like a top-down agrarian society, peasants' feudalism, to an attempt to kind of mirror or or have their own version of like Western industrialization, like Germany or England. And so, uh, a lot of uh, industrialization, a lot of factories, people leaving the countryside, moving to the urban centers, and it's kind of in this context that all these new ideas are coming together. Uh, particularly in Russia, people are not happy with the current uh, social, political, economic setup that puts a ruling uh, monarchy at the top. And so there are people, people have different articulations of, of how to change society. And it's within this context that, that Jewish and non-Jewish subjects of the Russian Empire are um, uh, subscribing to creating, building, and thinking about different ways of living. In 1901, almost 7,000 Jews had settled in Montreal. Betty Paul has worked within library and learning services at the JPL for over 30 years and is the innovator behind the Special Collections Outreach Initiative. 20 years later, this number had grown to over 45,000. Eastern European Jews start immigrating to Montreal in the early 1900s. The, the big wave is between 1909 and 1913, right before the First World War. And that's more or less where Eastern European Jewish immigration ends until the Second World War. But so to get a context, you have a lot of Eastern European Jews who are leaving uh, political turmoil, upheaval. The 1905 revolution in, in the Russian Empire created a lot of a change and a good deal of anti-Semitism as well. So you have a lot of Eastern European Jewish migrants coming to North America it's interesting to note that the what we call the Great Migration, meaning the massive arrival of East European Jews from the Russian Empire, took place or began almost simultaneously as the 1905 insurrection in Russia. So when young Jews began arriving here, they were fired by the revolution, by leftist ideas, uh, they were, uh, they had all the trappings of left-leaning militants and activists. So this community was far more to the left than any other. There's been a lot of academic and intellectual debate about whether people brought radicalism with them or became radicalized here, but not just for Jews, for all groups of uh, European immigrants. I think the answer often is it's both, and so it's not like these foreign, all these foreign ideas, like it's, it's, it's a question of both. It's, it's, it's a, it's a hybrid answer that both um, people brought radical ideas with them, but when they came here, they were faced with new realities that altered and changed uh, ideas that they brought with them. And then they sent those ideas back and they created new ideas. In Montreal and in Canada, especially comparing to French Canada and English Canada, which were much more conservative and traditional societies, and, and if you compare with immigrants from other origins as well in Europe. By the first decade of the 20th century, this community, the very complex and broad Jewish community of Montreal, uh, I would say that, that socialism and, and the left-leaning ideologies were becoming the dominant political trend, and it, it permeated everything. In, in institutional development and the way people behave, how they related to work, and how they conceived of the world for themselves and for the future. The other element is that the level of education was much lower in all communities, especially among French Canadians. Um, it changes something when, when a large percentage of the population doesn't read well and cannot read a newspaper and do not have access to an, the enlightenment that the education years brings to the individuals. 
cannot find good jobs, do not have uh, credentials. Um, and so the, the um, milieu was often here, was often the victim of demagogues, people who, who would say anything just to get elected and, and the people didn't have enough education. Not that they were stupid, but they, they didn't have that possibility of improving their lot by education. The uh, exploitation of workers was much harsher as well. Uh, people worked 60 hours a week at the beginning of the period. Wages were much lower. People had a much lower standard of living. Health conditions uh, were un incomparably bad. The uh, mortality rate of children was much more than today. Living conditions were terrible. I think that what you, when you, the issue of like working in the garment industry, you have a particular thing here. Even in the old country, Jews tended to work in the garment industry. There's a historical reason for it. And that is, you know, in the old religious society, there's something called shotness, which is the forbidden mixture of wool and linen. Linen, oh, linen that was a Freudian slip. Wow, that's good. Moish Dahlman is a Yiddish teacher, translator, and activist in left-wing and anti-authoritarian causes. And he's long considered the Jewish Public Library sacred grounds. And so Jews already are starting to make their own clothes. When North America is industrializing and urbanizing, which is, in Canada, it's one generation later than in the United States, there's a tremendous demand for, in the new cities, for ready-to-wear clothing. And so what you start is, you have a situation where not all Jewish immigrants are working in the clothing industry, but the clothing industry is dominated by Jews, both in terms of the employers and the workforce. And um, most, most Jews are working somehow or other in, in the, or tied to the ready-to-wear clothing industry. The problem when it comes to the situation of the Jews is that it's the, sub, the sweatshop system, which is that the industry is organized in such a way that it's not just one company that produces everything from top to bottom, but you have a, a wholesaler that subcontracts out work and so they're competing with all the other subcontractors for the lowest possible to make the lowest bid and that subcontractor subcontracts out various pieces of the labor of the labor process and so of course then they're competing with other people to bring things down to the lowest common denominator in terms of costs mostly wages and then the workers themselves often they're not working in factories you're working for a subcontractor are a sub 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 subcontractor, and they're, you're working in your own house. You're working with people who, your your whole family is employed, working for practically nothing, in very unsanitary, crowded conditions, long hours, um, extreme seventy hours a week for practically nothing, and um, to make other people rich, basically at the top. Often the difference between a boss and a worker was very little. A sub-sub-subcontractor was also probably working at home over a sewing machine, but was bossing somebody else around. This is what led to the eventual growth of the Jewish trade, first of all, of, of the Jewish trade unions, of the Jewish revolutionary movements, general left-wing movements. Yeah, in Toronto, um, I think there was something like 70 to 80 um, garment concerns along Spadina Avenue within a few, within a small block radius. And yes, the working conditions were uh, horrible. And that is where the trade union movement started. It started with uh, dressmaker, uh, dressmakers union strikes, uh, Winnipeg as well. Um, there was really no difference between the three cities in terms of the conditions that Jews were in. I think the only difference in Montreal, this was certainly the older community, it was the oldest of, of the three communities, but um, uh, yeah, there were, people were impoverished. Um, 
And, um, but because of the latent anti-Semitism um, that prevailed in, in sort of Canadian society, it was the only, it was really the only industry that Jews could work. And I, I, can, I have, I mean, I can tell you a personal anecdote. There. My father uh, tried to get into engineering school um, at University de Montreal, and he was told in no uncertain terms that, that you know, they weren't accepting Jews that particular day. And this was fairly common. He tried to get jobs in the aeronautics industry, same, same, you know, same issue. So Jews basically just got jobs wherever they could because they had families to support. And um, this was really the case in Winnipeg and Toronto and, of course, Montreal. Now, uh, Jews were seldom hired as sales clerks or bank clerks. Um, there were a lot of industries and places of commerce that were just closed off to Jews. Um, and obviously professional positions in engineering or law firms were completely out of the question. So they took whatever jobs were available to them. Um, and the booming garment industry here, which employed more people than any other, they were always on the lookout for laborers. Now many Jews had tailoring experience from back home, and those who didn't learned the skills very quickly. Between 1870 and 1930, uh, the needle trade employed more workers than any other industry in Montreal. 40% of them were Jewish. The rest of them were mostly French Canadian. And this grew to about 75 to 80% of all of Montreal's Jews who worked in the garment industry in some capacity. As was borne out, because the people in my father's generation were all in the, in the Schmanta business. Um, everybody, all of, the, all of his friends, many of his relatives, uh, people that I grew up with were all in the Schmanta business. And initially, you know, ultimately what happened was uh, all of that business when it got outsourced to the Orient. And um, there was no manufacturing left here, you know. This is a reality that younger generations of Jews perhaps don't realize it. But when I grew up, all the kids around me were Jewish kids. Their parents worked in factories. My mother was a homemaker. My par their parents worked in factories or they were taxi drivers when it seemed every taxi driver in Montreal was Jewish or they had small businesses, a little grocery or a newsstand on the corner or downtown. All the newsstands used to be Jewish or petty tradesmen, petty, um, you know, shopkeepers and what have you. I knew there was such a thing growing up as Jews who were professionals or Jews who were very wealthy. There were those, but we knew none of them. I knew none of them myself. Only the wealthiest Jews lived among Sherbrooke to the point where, if people remember the eccentric uh, theater on St. Lawrence Corner, Milton, that was originally a, a synagogue. And when they built it there on St. Lawrence and Milton, people said, how can you have a synagogue all the way up the hill? Who's going to walk all the way from, from, you know, the Jewish area to go to a synagogue on Milton within a few years, that was too far south, not north. Um, for many, many years, Jewish culture was situated primarily in the Monument National, was where all the Jewish theater took place. That was corner, what we now call René Levesque and St. Lawrence. The Jews used to rent it from the St. Jean-Baptiste Society, the owners. Um, that was where the focus of Jewish life originally was. Um, it, it progressed, I don't mean progressed in a good sense necessarily, but it moved continuously further and further north. The terms uptown and downtown Jews were really just shorthand for a kind of socio-cultural divide. Um, in the 30s and 40s, Montreal was kind of bisected by a, a rough line of demarcation. Um, that uh, divided the densely populated urban areas around the plateau on either side of St. Lawrence Boulevard or the main. Um, and this is where most of the new Jewish immigrants had settled. They started off from the area in old Montreal and they moved north. Um, now the so-called downtown Jews were the ones who populated those 
streets on either side of St. Lawrence Street, St. Urban Street, north to Mount Royal. These were the streets that were popularized in Mordecai Richler's novels, uh, The Apprenticeship of Dodie Kravitz and St. Urban's Horseman. The uptown Jews, who had been here for a little bit longer, uh, lived in the more affluent areas of Westmount and NDG and the western parts of downtown, kind of the Golden Mile um, area. Um, and so the terms uptown and downtown Jews uh, were, you know, they're not, they're not generally used in, in you know, serious scholarship, but when you hear those terms used, you're really referring to new immigrants and people who had already been established here. It's, it was the same situation in Amsterdam in the 17th century where you had a Sephardic population who had been, in, who had settled in Amsterdam for centuries and the poor Ashkenazic uh, population who were escaping pogroms in, in Poland were, they would have been the equivalent of the downtown Jews in Amsterdam. Same idea. There's a much spoken, much discussed notion of the uptown and downtown in Jewish Montreal history, in that the uptowner who were just one generation ahead from Eastern Europe often, but had had a chance to improve their situation, looked down upon the new arrivers and felt that they were shameful, that they, um, that they made the Jewish population in Montreal look bad. Um, and Mortimer B. Davis, the uh, wealthy owner of the uh, Imperial Tobacco Company, made important efforts to finance institutions and publications which promoted assimilation, which is one of the reasons why Jews accepted the 1903 law which made Jews Protestants for the purpose of education. In the early 1900s, um, Jews didn't have the same constitutional rights as Protestants and Catholics. And this uh, culminated in, um, in an event that happened uh, in 1903, when a little boy by the name of Jacob Pinsler uh, won a scholarship to um, attend a high school, but uh, he was declined because the Protestant school board, and the Protestant school board at the time had administered all of the Protestant schools where many Jews um, were had attended, they, they argued that the Pinslers didn't financially contribute to the school because they, they rented their, their flat. They were not property owners, and since property owners pay taxes, they were not really supporting the, the school system. Uh, so the Pinsker sued with the support of the Jewish community. Um, initially, the uh, Quebec Superior Court upheld the board's position because only, as I said, Protestants and Roman Catholics had constitutional rights. Um, now, this led to uh, some fallout, as, as it does, and in 1903, the provincial government adopted the Education Act, which stipulated that Jews would be considered Protestants for educational purposes. And the Protestant board would receive funding based on Jewish enrollment. Uh, this was obviously a contentious issue, and it remains one of the sort of milestone events of Jewish history in Quebec. Another milestone event in the history of um, Jews in, in Quebec. Um, there was obviously growing anti-Semitism in the 1920s. Um, and there was tension between the Jewish community and the Protestant school board, the Protestant school commission. And um, as is often the case, there was a response from the Catholic Church. Um, and because Jews had been designated honorary Protestants, as, as though that was even a thing, um, the Quebec Premier at the time, Tachereau, um, referred the Education Act to the Quebec Court of Appeal. Initially, the court ruled that the 
law violated the BNA Act, the British North America Act, and it was appealed again to the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council in London, so a lot of lawyers were getting wealthy, which is also you know, very often the case. And finally, what happened in 1928 was that um, Section 93 of the Act uh, was stipulated that um, Catholics and Protestants had guaranteed educational rights, but the Jews had no legal rights in the Quebec public school system. And it remained in force until the gov Quebec government scrapped the conventional school system and replaced it with linguistic school boards, and this happened in the 90s. So when I was going to school, I was going to a PSBGM school, a Protestant school board, even though 90% of the students in my, in my elementary and high school were Jewish. Just across um, Cabe Saint-Louis on Rue Saint-Denis, there's a building called l'Institut de Tourisme et d'Hôtellerie du Québec. And amongst other things, it's a, it's a professional training institute for um, students studying tourism and hotel and restaurant management. But back in 1913, it was the Aberdeen School. It was an elementary school. And in February of that year, Miss McKinley, who was a grade six teacher, called her Jewish pupils dirty and declared that they should be banned from the school. And that outburst triggered um, a political storm at the school uh, where Jews had constituted the majority of the, of the student body. Uh, news spread quickly um, from the grade six classroom to the other senior students and hundreds of Jewish pu pupils went on strike. They congregated in the park, Cadet Saint Louis, and they organized pickets. Um, some of the strikers marched to the Baron de Hirsch Institute and the newspaper office of the Kennedy Adler to demand that action be taken against Miss McKinley. Now, eventually, Miss McKinley apologized, but um, prominent Jewish community leaders who had negotiated with the principal and with the PSBGM, um, the apology, even though she had expressed her regret for having made inappropriate remarks, um, it was really not perceived as an apology. And what it did is it really bold-faced um, kind of nascent anti-Semitism within the sort of Anglo-Jewish culture of, of Montreal. Anti-Semitism was imported from Europe. It, it, something that emerged in Germany late in the 19th century uh, was redefined by the French in L'Affaire de Refus or in publications. It existed in Great Britain, so it reached Canada from those regions of Europe which were the closest to Canada economically and politically. So Germany, France and Great Britain contributed a great deal in ideology, in ideas, in notions, and people absorbed these events and these notions here began to look at Jews as the French or the English or the German would. Um, one has to distinguish between a French language version and an English language version in Montreal. There's at least two versions. Anglo-Protestant Canadians defined their own form of anti-Semitism, which was not like the Franco-Catholic form. Um, what defined French Canadians is they took their notions from the teachings of the Catholic Church. Before the Vatican Council of the 60s, the Catholic Church was the main vehicle for hostility to Jews. French Canadians went to Mass. They absorbed anti-Semitism in the liturgy, in the teachings, in the preaching. And often we find um, that when Jews would say, well, this, I'm sorry, this is anti-Semitic, and the French Canadians would answer, no, it's not. We're not anti-Semites. We just repeat what the priests say. Or we just repeat what our masters or our forebears say. If the church says it, it can't be wrong. See, that, that was the problem. Um, the objections of the church were doctrinal. 
In other words, a Jewish person is someone that rejected Christ and is not likely to be a good citizen, a good person, to be welcomed in the Catholic environment. The British said something else. They said, for racial reasons, we should reject. This is more the German version. For racial reasons, we should reject Jews because they contaminate our people. The French Canadians didn't say this because the notion of the church is that all humanity can be converted to Catholicism. And these racial barriers are more superficial. It was perceived at the time that the quicker East European Jews would learn English and behave like good Protestants, the better it would be for them and for the Jewish community altogether. Uh, well, it doesn't work that way, of course. It takes more time. But uh, we, we see that, indeed, um, that was one of the solutions proposed. The other solution was a solution proposed by the Jewish Public Library and other institutions that, yes, you, you, you have to integrate, assimilate, become good citizens, but remain Jews. And to remain Jews, you need Jewish institutions, such as the Jewish Public Library. I remember a hot summer afternoon in 1912 when my late father, Reuben Brynen, turned the key in the door of a modest house on St. Urban Street. The first home of the Jewish Public Library was there, and a small group of friends helped them to found it. I remember that when my father spoke from the steps of that humble house, he said he was firmly convinced that this small library would grow into one of the proudest achievements of our community. There were many divisions in the Jewish left here. Um, one division was left Zionism or, or left nationalists on the one hand, and then on the other hand, the internationalists. So those in favor of a Jewish state or the support for a Jewish people and those who wanted to be part of the general overall revolution which would engulf all of Western society, basically the communists. So these differences were major and kept these people apart. They were all left-leaning, but they did not see the world the same way. Um, this was visible in many other ways. Um, the the uh, unions that became organized, the uh, circles, uh, intellectual, literary, artistic, uh, bore the differences. Some of them were more internationalist and some more left-leaning. Uh, the Jewish Public Library, of course, was not internationalist in that sense. It was leaning towards a form of diaspora nationalism. The literal books that became the Jewish Public Library, or the literal books that eventually would serve as the first books in the library, were the books that came from the lending libraries of radicals, Jewish radicals in Montreal, and also that Jewish radicals in Montreal were the ones who were deeply involved in creating the Jewish Public Library, both the first attempt in 1912 and then again in 1914. So within the context of Jewish political movements in Eastern Europe, there and this is not um, unique to the Jewish experience, it's very much common across the European leftists of the time, there's a big investment or understanding in the idea that culture and revolutionary politics go together, the idea of people building themselves up, having reading circles, learning. Uh, there's, there's, a whole, there's a huge emphasis on culture as part of the struggle for the working class. And so in Montreal, uh, the first attempts to create the public library, you know what, I think Moy should tell part of this story, but the Jewish People's Library, let's say, because that was the name of the institution for the first uh, 20 years of its existence. People's um, Library and People's University. <laughs> exactly. I've heard this story from you several times in my life. <laughs> um, and you'll hear it several more for sure. <laughs> 
please. I look forward to it. Yeah, so this People's Library um, in 1912 is when there were attempts. They, they had a bunch of public events in the spring leading up to a big strike, the first big or one of the major strikes that happened in 1912. Um, and the public library was started by figures like Brynin, Khazanovich, Moses Schmulsen, different characters who were involved in the founding several years later. But yes, in, in 1912, as a strike is going on, there are attempts to organize what becomes the library. And they have hour, they have library hours that are set up to accommodate workers who are working during the day, for example. It is very much, an, it's called the People's Library and People's University. There's a real self-development, pulling yourself by your bootstraps education concept going on. Uh, and uh, this is really like seen as a site for uplifting the workers and, and the Jews kind of at the same time. And it opens on May Day, incidentally. When you read the first annual report, which was published in 1915, it's amazing the extent to which people invested time and energy voluntarily to support the Jewish Public Library, to become a member, to donate books, to raise funds. It's amazing. It's, uh, it's a beehive of activity uh, without government funds and with basically no support from the wealthier segment of the community who did not really entertain much hope or interest um, in the Yiddish culture. And um, the, the ideas which was, were imported from Eastern Europe found a place in the Jewish Public Library to, to be voiced out, to be discussed. You know, we, we forget 1914, we say, well, that's the beginning, but, but the beginning of the community altogether is, is basically that day too. When you look at the chart of Jewish immigration to Montreal or Canada, it begins in 1904. There's almost no immigration before. And so people are still getting off the boats when the Jewish Public Library was founded. And it was founded because the there was a, a surge in numbers. Suddenly, in 1911, there were 30,000 Jews in Montreal, enough for a newspaper to appear, for schools to be founded, and for a cultural center to exist. There was a, a Jewish public for it now. And that's this moment, a unique moment, which, which saw the appearance of the Jewish Public Library. Uh, Yiddish Folks Bibliothèque. It's interesting. The Folks Bibliothèque, of course, has a different meaning. It means the place where the Jewish people is found and its library exists. Uh, I was stunned at the extent of involvement and how much people invested in the institution, how much they desired its existence. And um, it's interesting to consider that uh, when it opened, it had only 1,500 books, most of which came from the Politian Library, which existed a couple of years before, and um, a $3,000 budget. It's, it's amazing. All of this given by the people, you know, in a nutshell, the Jewish Public Library is the Jewish community and its history and its destiny starting in 1914. Um, it played a key role in the first half of the 20th century in, in regrouping all the cultural forces, bringing writers, thinkers, Yiddishists, activists, political militants, all together in one place to share what they had as a Jewish culture, Yiddish culture, with, with sometimes a great deal of differences in perspective, politically and otherwise, but that's fine. It was perceived as a place where people could merge, come together, not as a place where people would be forced to adopt a position which was common to, to all. Um, it did a lot to educate Jews, 
as to their own culture, but as also as to what they could expect from this country to become better citizens, to master the English or French languages, to obtain competence in certain domains and find work. Um, I think it was basically at the beginning a school for adults um, where people improved their notions, um, become, became better read, more cultivated and exposed to all forms of cultural manifestations. Uh, it did a lot to organize collective forces. Thank you for joining us today as we started our deep dive into Jewish leftist history in Montreal. Tune in for episode two as we learn more about the radical roots of the Jewish left, including the role of reading circles, the richness of Yiddish culture, and an introduction to the key players of the movement. A huge thank you to our guests, Pierre, Sam, Eddie, and Moisha. Their in-depth biographies can be found in our show notes. Recollections is a production of Jewish Public Library Archives and Special Collections. Additional production, editing, and operations by Ellen Belshaw and Izel Carter. Research support from Leah Graham, Sam Papas, and Eddie Paul. Sound design by Josh Bogusky and Izel Carter. Musical score by Danielle Zambo. Sound effects provided by Pixabay. Thank you to our sponsors, the Azrieli Foundation and Federation CJA. You can find out more about this podcast and all of our other happenings at jpl-curates.org or sign up for our Archives and Special Collections newsletter, Der Zamler. You've been listening to Recollections. This is Ellen Belshaw. And Ezel Carter, signing off in, in solidarity. solidarity. Do you say it first or do I? Me? And you say, and you're listening to Recollections? Okay. But give it the theater kid. Theater kid. Yeah. Okay.